Sheena Tam Se Kareta Se Shin Shemo Crowds of men and women, young and old, surge towards the black police-escorted Lexus as it comes to a halt at the main doors of the Holy Trinity Cathedral in Tbilisi's Old Town. Every Sunday, many Georgians travel far and wide to be here. Others wait from the early hours of the morning to get the best spot. They are coming to attend neither a Hollywood blockbuster film premiere nor the release of a new iPhone. They are here to catch a glimpse of Patriarch Ilya II, the spiritual leader of the Georgian Orthodox Church. The Patriarch definitely does have the fame of a pop star. It's, it's, uh, it's just a phenomenon that cannot be observed anywhere else. He has what I value greatly, which is that gift of calm. He spreads about him a calmness. One is calm and he's a, it's a sort of soothing of the soul in his presence. Calmness has not been a hallmark feature of modern-day Georgia. Georgia's first three presidents in the post-1991 independence era ascended to power as revolutionary heroes but were subsequently branded and ousted as villains. This same fate befell Zviad Gamsahurdia, Eduard Shevardnadze, and Mikhail Saakashvili, all of whom failed to fulfill expectations engendered by an initial post-victory euphoria. We are a very individualistic, very ambitious, very, um, in English you would say, Mediterranean type uh, bunch. Uh, every Georgian thinks he's, he or she is a king and we're very sort of driven, very Italian to put it in your uh, very emotion. And it is very hard, uh, almost impossible in a nation like this to, to be loved by everyone. For years, if not decades, Ilya II has stood as the most revered, respected and loved person in the country. He presided over one of the most extraordinarily religious revivals known to mankind and is behind a Georgian vernacular version of the Bible. But while it is easy to tick off his professional achievements, it is his altruistic and charismatic personality that prompts people from all walks of life to bestow accolades. But the Patriarch himself clearly has what we would call a hinterland. He has an, an inner life, not only his spiritual life, but also the fact that he's a musician, he's a writer, he's a man with a, a very sophisticated imagination, with a cultural sensitivity. And that combined with his spiritual formation, I think means that he's very much a three-dimensional person. And people like that tend not just to be the, the tools of any party or any system. This is the, the mystique this is the uh, metaphysical aspect of his life. I think the secret is his simplicity uh, and the, the, the lightness with, with which he manages to carry his greatness and the, the sense of humor, which is childlike yet very exquisite.
During its long history, Georgia has seen occupation, resistance and violence. Systems, empires and ideologies have been replaced. Independence did not bring peace to the former Soviet Republic. The loss of the two breakaway territories of Abkhazia and South Ossetia following an armed conflict with Russia added another sad chapter to an already lengthy novel of warfare. Throughout the centuries, faith and for the last 35 years, the patriarch have helped the Georgian people to overcome their trials and tribulations. Mas matlets show the rebel what's left. Am bolor am deni mete ulit lizgan malobashi. Chuni sam shulus mi mart. Rametu tats rebuli. Sabtu da kavshi dan machin rodi sats. Lami sakza uli ko Christianu bada atheismi zin varivda. Mas da imi shemd kom period shits. Man udi de siroli tamasha katholi kulturis da katholi solyerebis shenar chuni bash. Having ascended to the throne at the height of the Cold War, when the repression of religion by the communist regime was at its height, Ilya has become the force behind the former Soviet Republic's unprecedented spiritual revival. While for the last three decades most churches around the world have experienced a decline of followers, the Georgian Orthodox Church has returned to its former glory, with thousands of churches either reopened or newly erected, monasteries built and numbers of churchgoers soaring. His Holiness became the Patriarch at a very crucial time when uh, Georgia was at its peak in terms of uh, economic wealth, stability. This is the late 70s, the Brezhnev era. Little did we know that we were 10, 15 years away from the greatest geopolitical collapse of the 20th century. The four million Georgians were facing another tectonic collision, another phenomenal shift in economic, social and ideological parameters, as overnight the communist socialist system was replaced by a capitalist consumerist mentality. Ever since the Soviet Union collapsed, we have seen nothing but, uh, but a, a very fast demise in living standards, uh, horrific civil wars, a uh, uh, very sharp decline uh, from what was perhaps the richest, the wealthiest state uh, of the Soviet Union to one of the poorest countries in the world in the beginning to mid-90s. Having adopted Christianity in 337 AD, Georgia held on to its religion over the next 18 centuries, resisting waves of invaders, including the hordes of Genghis Khan and Tamerlane. Georgian Orthodox Church has, a, has an interesting history of being a sort of main consolidator of our national identity as well as of the state and at the same time we did not experience the same problems that uh, let's say Europe experienced during reformation or the uh, or the religious wars that uh, are a normal part of European history <laughs> Although religion under the Soviets was not officially banned, the church was subjugated, heavily controlled, and its reach was severely limited. When Ilya ascended to the role of patriarch, he found his church in need of resurrection. We were amidst the, the atheist country when Georgian church out of 5,000 some churches only had 10 opened and working. I've seen him during the Soviet times. It was late 70s. Uh, only a few numbers of people attended churches in those days. And I've seen the worst kind of repressions, but nevertheless, this man was uncompromising 
He led the church throughout the turbulent times. He published the Bible in Georgian for the first time in 70 years, which was a phenomenal achievement during the communist times. In 1990, Ilya experienced a major personal triumph. After almost 200 years, the Georgian Orthodox Church was again pronounced autocephalous, or completely self-governing. Under his reign, some 1,200 churches have been erected, rebuilt or revived, while the number of clergy and worshippers has soared. However, some Western critics have noted that it was not only heaven that helped the Patriarch in his mission. Well, all religious leaders in the Soviet period were chosen by the Soviet authorities. First Secretary of the Communist Party, it was Shevardnadze who made sure that Ilya II became the Patriarch. I do not uh, blame uh, anybody from the Church why they were not fighting against communism harder than civilians were doing. It's one of the things that's, I think, most deeply to the credit of the Patriarch that although he came into, into problems in the Soviet Union, he's never carried with him that, um, that sense of being compromised by, by all that. He's somehow managed to keep in the church and in wider society a trust that um, assumes that even though he came to office through a very dark and difficult period, he wasn't tainted by it. Today, nearly 85% of Georgia's population of 4.7 million belongs to the Orthodox Church, which has become the most trusted institution in the country. I have underlined in my uh, program speech the special role that we think the Church should play in consolidating the nation. And uh, the conflict resolution and peace building and building of, uh, of, of a united Georgia I think that Orthodox Church has the most of possibility to present this unification emotion into, 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 into population and I think that state should partner on these uh, peace building projects with the church.
The church stood together with the nation throughout the struggle for independence. The 9th of April 1989, one of the most memorable days in Georgia's recent history, was possibly the first nail in the coffin of the once mighty Soviet Union. On that day, thousands of Georgians gathered in the center of Tbilisi to protest demands from Abkhazia to secede from Georgia and receive full republican status within the Soviet Union. Although the demonstration was peaceful, Moscow reacted by sending in troops. And the 9th of April was um, when all the demonstrations and the meetings had reached a climax. And it was quite clear to many people that something pretty awful was about to happen. I was there uh, among the young and 19 women died under the soldiers' shell. And um, you had all these special troops flown in from Moscow who had, had no sleep, were extremely irritable. Um, I have spent, uh, I was blinded on one eye, and I have spent two months in the hospital fighting for my life. And most experienced observers expected trouble. Um, then the Patriarch appeared to address us. And we were standing there facing the tanks, uh, very proud and very uh, sort of excited about what we thought was defending of our country and not being the cowards and not surrendering to the brutal force and just standing, standing there with our palms rather than fists and saying no to the terror. And the Patriarch had what I can only describe as the most phenomenal moment of, of courage. He stood in front of us and told us to go home, which was unthinkable, uh, given the emotion of the crowd, given the elevation, given the expectation, uh, the longing for heroism, the love of our history, everything. He went completely against our will, our thinking, our hearts, our minds. We said no and stood there and died. Many of us died. Some of us have been scarred for life. We should have listened to the man. Uh, because the Soviet Union would have collapsed anyway. Without this terrible sacrifice, we would have gained our freedom just like 13 other republics did. Uh, perhaps we would not have laid ground for a sometimes rather hysterical tone of our nationalist movement, which has in subsequent years led us to quite a few mistakes. Exactly two years to the day after that fateful night, Georgia declared its independence. The country's first elected president, Zviad Gamsahurdia, espoused a philosophy of ethnic nationalism and relied on the Orthodox Church to provide values that would depict national identity a role that the church and many of its members embraced. Ilya's first major test as patriarch came in 1997. Surging numbers of worshippers had strengthened the church on the outside, but a new conflict had erupted inside the institution. Well, there was quite a rise in what one might call fundamentalist or um, very traditional orthodox uh, thought and theology and ecclesiology in Georgia, within the Georgian Orthodox Church in the 1990s. Several monasteries and monastic communities left the Patriarchate because they didn't like what they regarded as its liberal uh, theology and its relations with other, other Christian churches which were not orthodox and they broke away from the Patriarchate, and I think that really concerned Ilya. 
To keep his institution together, the Patriarch withdrew the Georgian Orthodox Church from the World Council of Churches and the Council of European Churches, two organizations the Georgian Orthodox Church had joined or had been forced to join, as some would argue, by the communist regime in Moscow in the early 1960s. Therefore, for many Georgians, membership in those two councils was tainted by association with a dark spiritual period in the country's and the church's history. He was playing a difficult role trying to keep the different parties in the church together, but at the same time, perhaps he, given that he had formerly been you know, one of the leading figures in the World Council of Churches during the Soviet period, Perhaps he could or should have done more to keep the Georgian Orthodox Church in contact with other Christian churches. Instead, the concept that only Orthodox Georgians are real Georgians began to gain momentum within the country. In the later years of the Shevardnadze regime, there were terrible violent attacks on many religious minority communities. And people were beaten, religious literature was burned in the street and inside buildings. The fact that the Georgian Orthodox Patriarchate has secured its place in the constitution, a privileged position, the uh, 2002 agreement between the um, Patriarchate and, and the government signed by Shevardnadze and Patriarch Ilya. This gave the Patriarch immunity from prosecution. It gave the church the right to determine which religious communities can even call themselves churches. It gave them the right to determine who could print or publish or import religious literature. And de facto, it left society believing that the Orthodox Church has a veto over the activity of any other community. There have been voices, as we all know, in the Orthodox Church of Georgia over the last 20 years, which have been quite violently hostile to other Christians, which have demanded um, civic penalties for um, people who belong to other churches, disadvantages in society. Um, violent language has been used, there's been conflict with the World Council of Churches. The Patriarch has consistently pulled the church back from this, challenged extremism, tried to make sure that the church remains solidly rooted in its history but not anxious and defensive all the time. Oh. Это не 10 лет истории, не 20 лет истории. Это веками продолжается. Тфилиси prides itself with uh, being uh, a, a, perhaps the widest religious and national spectrum you can find in Soviet Union. You can walk on uh, one street in the old town and see the synagogue, the Armenian Gregorian Church, the Russian Church, the Georgian Church, uh, Muslim Mosque. Uh, and uh, and uh, we Georgians have always been extremely cosmopolitan from that standpoint. August 2008 brought new sorrow and devastation after President Saakashvili ordered a large-scale military assault against separatists in South Ossetia following recurrent skirmishes along the border, Russia responded to this short but fierce armed conflict by deploying troops, launching airstrikes and invading Georgia's heartland. Russia halted its attacks within a week, but it was left to the Patriarch to heal the country's wounds. Ilya II went into the war zone to bring back the bodies of fallen soldiers. During the August war of 2008, I saw Patriarch on TV acting heroically. He visited Gori, the city that was mercilessly bombed by the, uh, by the aggressors. And I've seen him side by side with the Russian general. And the Russian general kept a small distance behind the Patriarch who was walking in front of him and I just can't forget the look of this Russian general looking at, at the Patriarch with such a reverence and that was something 
unforgettable. Yes, it was something that he could do uh, as a churchman, as an Orthodox patriarch, which uh, was acceptable to the Russians, possible for him, impossible for any Georgian politician. The Georgian politician would probably not have been allowed to do it by the Russians and would have been regarded by the Georgian people as a traitor. But the church is, was, is able to transcend these. While the war lasted only a few days, even years later its aftershocks had yet to subside. Georgia's path towards democracy was derailed, its reputation in the West was severely damaged, and its territorial integrity was shattered. Today a peaceful return of the breakaway territories of Abkhazia and South Ossetia remains Tbilisi's top foreign policy priority with the consequence that the keys to Georgia's healing and fulfillment are at least partly in Russia's hands. Kasagibia rochu entu es vaks zalian zime tslebi. Ta ar aris misaghebi des dasagmobi es urtietuebi rats ur kvakana shoris arsebobs. Arsebobs amis mizezebi, arsebobda mizezebi, zalian devri politikos ver gaer kva garda meol etapze da saubudro chven miviget ukidrosat zime situatsia ori kvakana surtietobashi. Me absolutva dartsonebuli va rom چون درویش گان ولو باشی موفق خرخت، آغاز کند، ایماس، و چون کند ایستوری ولاد، چون آغاز سیل باد، داوالا گیب ترسه تن اورتیر تو بسته چون نبوده ولی اورتیر تو بیکن ما مزرد داشتید با سال بدرو تصور مختبرم دلیل متوش ما داشتید با درو مگرام آغاز سیل باد تصور مختبر. It is possible for Ilya to go to Moscow and shake hands not only with with a, with a patriot but even with Putin. And to get away with it, whereas no Georgian politician uh, will get away with that. Uh, Patriarch is creating a very good format of decreasing temperature between nations, between decreasing uh, hostility between nations. The Patriarch somehow managed to be not only religious leader of the nation, but also being involved in many cases, many issues, which are far beyond of uh, church and its uh, authority. And he initiated such things which had far-reaching uh, results. And it was particularly important when the other uh, public institutions were failing to fulfill their role. We spoke together about some of the the challenges that all the churches face in Europe and beyond, I gained a sense of the, the importance and the difficulty of the way in which the Orthodox Church in Georgia and the Orthodox Church in Russia form a kind of um, informal link between two nations which otherwise have so many, so many tensions, and that's quite important in the region too. He recognises the historic Orthodox ties between Georgia and Russia, and this has also protected the role of the Georgian Orthodox Church in Abkhazia and South Ossetia. The Russian Orthodox, the Moscow Patriarchate, has never recognized that, those, uh, that the Orthodox communities in those two places should not be under the Patriarchate of, of, of Tbilisi, of Georgia. So that is a fundamental thing for him, keeping the unity of the Georgian Orthodox Church within Georgia, including Abkhazia and South Ossetia, and he has been successful, and his almost pro-Russian stance, which is probably quite courageous, has actually helped that goal. Following the Rose Revolution in 2003, Georgia, under the presidency of Mikhail Saakashvili, 
has been hailed as one of the most, if not the most, pro-Western country among the former Soviet republics. Lured for almost a decade by the prospect of joining NATO and integrating with Europe, the country has been jumping through hoops to please the West. But in the eyes of many Georgians, there has been little to show for it. Questions continue to be raised as to whether a Western lifestyle should be imposed on one of the world's oldest civilizations. At the forefront of this debate is the patriarch himself. We don't view our history in, uh, in dimensions of one year or several years. We are a nation of a unique historic tradition. And when we are talking about our, our identity, we are talking about history as well. Uh, while being a big proponent of education and supporter of Georgian youth studying abroad, the Patriarch has regularly called on society to desist from sending younger children out of the country. Having lived in Moscow, having lived for most of my life in UK, uh, having worked in New York as well, I have come across a lot of Georgians who are there with their families, with both of the parents living in the same household, where children speak uh, very little Georgian. Uh, they don't really associate themselves with Georgia. They don't associate, they don't understand the culture. I, I do share the fact that it's a shame when so many people leave the country the loss of the culture gradually happening over the years. I mean, I st still speak Georgian now, but definitely not to the level that I would if I'd have stayed on. During the spring of 2013, Georgia made headlines again when the country's first ever gay rights rally planned in Tbilisi by the Georgian section of LGBT to mark the International Day Against Homophobia was attacked and disrupted. The involvement of Orthodox clergy in violent actions against members of sexual minority groups cast further doubt on the church's willingness to embrace democratic values. The gay parade was uh, interrupted by uh, a mob of uh, Orthodox believers uh, and uh, the Ilya himself made a statement uh, which was um, very, very ambiguous. He said, we distance ourselves from violence. He didn't condemn it utterly. And then he went on to say that homosexuality, according to all religions and all scientific investigation, is a disease like drug addiction and it demands a control and treatment and it should not be tolerated and people should not be allowed to infect the rest of the nation with it. Many members of the church regard declarations of the rights of sexual minorities not as a matter of tolerance and freedom of expression, but as a Western threat to Georgian heritage, culture and traditions. We politicians or representatives of democratic political parties uh, believe that human rights are universal. 
and they apply to all the people. But religious teachings and beliefs are slightly different about the universality of certain values and certain things. And they are based their judgment, in, in, in our case, Bible, in other case, some other holy uh, books and uh, concepts. Intolerance has to be overcome. And we understand that there is a moment and emotion of intolerance in Georgia. But uh, I would not link that specifically to Orthodox Church. This moment and emotion of intolerance points to defiance towards an unrestrained transformation process that many Georgians perceive as cultural imperialism enforced by Western institutions. This group of Georgians sees globalization as yet another attempt by dominant foreign powers to impose on them a culture that exalts American and European values, eroding in the process their local heritage and traditions. Hence, the obsession with rampant consumerism and the infatuation with frivolous pop idols are partly blamed for the corrosion of indigenous values, the breakup of families and the disintegration of traditional social structures that have been integral to the survival of the nation throughout its history. As much as we are excited and uh, uh, rejoiced and enlightened by the new era of regaining our much uh, beloved statehood and uh, having our own country. We are at the same time very wary of the, the dangerous side of, sides of globalization that our little culture faces. It's not only the Orthodox Church which is questioning the issue whether Europe will bring good things to Georgia or wrong things to Georgia. To Georgia. There are some political groups and politicians who are questioning this issue as well. How much do we know about Georgia? Is the European Union in a position to determine what is right and what is wrong for the country? Does the West possess the cultural sensitivity to look beyond the maintenance of pipelines, the improvement of fiscal management systems, fair elections and other institutional reforms which top the World Bank's checklist, but which for the impoverished Georgian majority pale in the face of the daily struggle for food, healthcare, housing and education. Western and Georgian perception of political, economic and social developments in the former Soviet republics are rarely in sync. We had reformation in Europe, we had, we had religious wars in Europe, we had Europe being split on the basis of uh, different uh, religious orientations. With the, even including within the Christianity. The reformation that was brought by uh, uh, Martin Luther and uh, by Zwingli and the processes that happened in, in Great Britain, they, those were religious processes which were transformed into politics. So having their own experience, judging from their own historic experience, they understand, they view uh, the processes in Georgia in the sem similar context. But, we have a different history. We have a history of tolerance. We never had genocides here. We have never made holocausts here. Smaller nations uh, have uh, additional problems if compared to bigger nations, uh, especially a nation like Georgia, which uh, has no immediate relative on the world. Uh, when uh, our language is spoken and understood only by uh, most four million uh, citizens or individuals over the world. Uh, 
uh, and uh, being located where we are located. Uh, and it's important to make extra measures, important measures, for preserving our culture, traditions, language. But uh, these measures uh, and uh, isolation as such are two different things. Every educated Georgian thinks that Georgia needs to learn a lot uh, from the West in, in every way, whether it's science or politics or business, and that to stick in Georgia at, and refuse to uh, have what the West offers is, is, is not a, a way forward that Georgia needs to make political and economic progress. A contemporary individual Georgian, which you meet in the street, is basically of the same type as a contemporary European individual. Yet, uh, we have not been successful enough to build political traditions, and in some cases even social traditions, for these concrete European, let's say, individuals. Our patriarch likes to say that globalization uh, has a, a, a subject and an object, or an actor and a target, and small countries uh, in this process happen to be the target. And so your, uh, your goal is a very old, uh, um, uh, sophisticated culture is to uh, shed the old skin, if you will, without losing your spine. While society was busy shedding its Soviet skin during the two decades following independence, the Orthodox Church was emerging as the country's most respected institution and the backbone of the new Georgia. And respect generated influence. Although the Georgian constitution stipulates the separation of church and state, in 2002 President Eduard Shevardnadze and Patriarch Ilya II signed a concordat giving the church official status and also granting it an advisory role in the government. Officially the church has maintained a neutral role in politics, but it has used the trust of the people as a legitimate way to exert its influence. One reason why the church does have so much influence in many poorer countries is often, of course, that poorer countries are poor partly because of poor governance, chaos and corruption. Poverty then turns the wheel and creates more corruption. Corruption creates more poverty, and so it goes on. In societies like that, and there are many around the globe, it's more than ever important that there is one community, one group of people, who say, well, we are answerable to something more than just our own material ambition, answerable even to something more than just patriotism. We are answerable for human dignity before God. And when you have leaders who, who really are rooted in that vision, those are the ones who make a difference when human dignity is so abused and so denied around them. Our tradition of church and uh, the handwriting of His Holiness has never been to run the earthly affairs of the nation. This is not the church is there for. Uh, this is on one hand. On the other hand, this uh, concrete separation of spiritualism from daily life is a very non-Eastern thing, very remote for our way of thinking. Religion and faith is not something you put in a museum and pick up on Sunday Mass and uh, perform as a ritual, drop it there and leave. In a democratic society, then everyone has to welcome contributions from all parts of society, and, and the patriarch is, is, is clearly free to, to put forward his point of view. But the government has to rule on behalf of the whole of society, all the population of Georgia, of whatever faith. The Patriarch has been extremely careful and balanced. He, he, he's very omnipresent in his writings, in his speeches, and I, I see him more as a visionary, someone who defines the, the vector. Political subscribers, we are doing the bar, trying to create a smartphone, Today, 
I believe the church always has to uphold a vision for society, not just for itself, but for the society in which it finds itself. I think it has to have points of hope and challenge for the society it's in, and therefore it can't simply sit on the sidelines. I think it's very important then that the church does play a role in the, the renewal of a society and of a nation. And I believe that's what the Patriarch has, has attempted in Georgia. Now clearly, that is something very different from taking sides, from being partisan. And I think it's a very bad thing indeed when any church puts its, its weight behind a single political party or a single political program. But it can still usefully and necessarily challenge a government, a party, a, a nation to rise more effectively to the challenges of the day. Instead of rising to the challenges of the day, 10 years after independence, the nation was stagnating and the birth rate declining. Drawing on his popularity, Ilya announced that he would become the godfather to all babies born into families with two or more children, and also promised that his godchildren would receive bursaries from the church for their education. This move lifted the birth rate by 25% in just five years. The patriarch performs regular mass baptisms and is now godfather to over 10,000 children. I was very struck by the Patriarch telling me about his offer to be godfather to every third child born in the country. I think that is a, a wonderful bit of what you might call lateral thinking. It's one thing to say the population ought to be growing. It's another to say, well, I will personally take some responsibility for encouraging this and to do it in such an imaginative way and such a pastoral way. characteristic of the Patriarch is his ability to find a common language with presidents and royals, pop stars and intellectuals, investment bankers and peasants, as well as with the men on the street. He is an honorary member of the country's Academy of Sciences, is regarded within Georgia as an expert in the fields of psychology, philosophy and theology, and is concerned with agricultural policy as a fundamental issue for the future development of the country. Man, mitcha im tutas gama chera. Me vi tsi rogor me agex ni rogor unda mokta se skola pe rogor unda gaget. Una khaus chakit khya tavisi er tertim kona lo bi zdros da ramu deni jer miu kit khaus am permis er tertim permis tis Germania shi mas am dina zedmi tsi am ni tiso da ra rogor unda gaget abu logo dasalur sadur khesh. Tar mo dgin et kwen amasakis am deni pasukis ge bo biskoni adam yani. Having breathed new life into the Georgian church, the patriarch began to resurrect old Orthodox traditions that had been virtually forgotten for centuries. I'm 
ნაციზე, ვინაიდან საქართველო არ იყო დამოუკიდებელი და ეკლესიასაც ავტოკეფალია დაკარგული ხონა, შემდეგ კომუნისტური რეჟიმი იყო. ეს მნიშვნელოვნად თავისი საკადრისი ადგილი არ ეკავა საქართველოში ქართულ სიმღერას და განსაკუთრებით გალობას, რომელიც უბრალო თაგძალული იყო ჯერ მეფის რუსეთში, შემდეგ კიდე კომუნისტურ ხანაში. და პატრია ქიროვსკი დადგა, როგორც კი ავიდა სამდოთარო საპატრიარქო ტახტზე მან მიზნად დაისახა ერთად მიზნად ქართული გალობის აღორძინება ძველი ქართული საგალობის აღორძინება ამისთვის მან შექმნა გუნდები სიონში ანჩისხატში ძალიან ბევრ ღვაწლმოსილ ადამიანს დაავალა ქართული გალობის ხელმძღვანელობიდან სამების ტაძრისათვის და უნდა იყოთ ხელმძღვანელი და თქვენ უნდა მოიყვანოთ ეკლესიაში ხალხი თქვენი დალობით He gave me this lovely gift which was the CD of his uh, compositions and uh, it's it's basically Elia's um, hymns and they're based on some of the Georgian folk music. Um, he did a great composition of Ave Maria, obviously an adaptation of the famous Ave Maria piece. And uh, I often listen to it and it's so stunning, it's so beautiful, it's so dramatic, but also very peaceful. The atmosphere of this record is definitely something that I would love to try to kind of work towards as an artist myself. That was a joyful experience. Um, we were fortunate enough through our host to, to go to the choir, to sit with the choir. ძალიან დიდი ადგილი უკავია მუსიკის სფეროში. ის ის არ არის მარტო დაჯილდოებული And so we went up we sat with the choir and the music was incredible. What a gift, what an extraordinary gift to have that not only are you close to God in your prayers, but to receive from God that gift of being able to make music that lifts other people to God. He is wonderful at ceremony. He's not a great speaker, but his presence is wonderful, the way he conducts a service. There is no suggestion in him of personal self-interest. He isn't trying to get elected. He isn't trying to make money. He's not trying to win a contract. He doesn't appear to be seeking popularity. He seems to be speaking uh, in the name of God, or of a church, of, of, of a, a community of believers. And so that inspires trust. He has always had the people in his heart. The people comes first. 
and then interests, other interests come second. Unlike the government officials mm -hmm. who are viewed as serving their own interest. Does this ability to put the interests of the people first sufficiently explain his popularity? Did he gain influence because Georgia's political elites never stood a chance of winning the hearts and minds of the people given the difficulties of the transition period? Was the patriarch simply in the right place at the right time? For me it's not a surprise that many Georgians hold on to the patriarch as their father figure, just as they hold on to their faith. And I think that governments come and go, civil wars come and go, invasions and so on, but the church is there, the patriarch is there, and so it's not a surprise to me that he remains almost like a rallying point for people to hold on to, particularly in times of trouble. He's been in, in the position he's been in for so many years and he really, it, I wouldn't say he's set a single foot wrong. He gives to everybody what Christians expect from, uh, from the head of the church, the hope. This is the basic of Christian belief, the hope, and he gives them a lot. Uh, people listen to his preachings with such a reverence and awe. Uh, they are known for, for its wisdom, uh, astute observations, and moral teachings. Uh, he is occupying dangerously huge space in the hearts and minds of Georgian people. And dangerously meaning uh, not anything negative by itself, but uh, meaning the space which uh, at some point could become empty. And indeed, the 80-year-old cleric's age and health raise concerns about the future of the Georgian church and the nation as a whole. Georgia comprises Europe's strategic borderland separating the Christian and Muslim worlds. One only needs to look at Georgia's volatile neighborhoods, and most notably terrorism in Chechnya and Dagestan, to understand that Georgian internal affairs could ultimately infiltrate Europe. Will a new spiritual and moral leader emerge who can help Georgia build a robust, liberal and democratic political system without compromising its distinctive cultural heritage? Many people just don't want to think about what comes next when he's no longer with them. They're just trying to alleviate those fears. This time will be the first time that there will not be the involvement of the Soviet authorities in Moscow. Uh, the Soviet Union is long gone. How influential, influential the Georgian political leadership will be, now that remains to be seen. No, I don't think Georgia is in danger of falling apart now, less in danger than it has been for, for uh, ever since uh, it regained its freedom. Uh, my own feeling is although it's economically very much dependent on the West and has to do things for the West that probably would rather not do, like sending 2,000 men to Afghanistan, um, it's, um, it is in a better position. Our faith uh, says that the tree is recognized by its fruit that it gives. And by now, His Holiness has, has given birth to a whole generation of thinkers, leaders, uh, theologists, church leaders. And it, Georgian Church today is no longer a one-man institute. Certainly, it's the role of anyone in that kind of position of authority to make sure that he himself is taking responsibility for gathering people around him who have vision, who have honesty and dependability. The bishops that I've met, the younger bishops I've met from Georgia, seem to me to be people who have, who have caught something of, of his vision, something of his, his capacity. The challenge, I think, for the church and the nation in Georgia is to say, well, how do you, how do you create a climate where people like that can, can develop and flourish in an, another generation. It is a difficulty when you have a great charismatic figure who's so trusted and so loved, but it's a bit like um, 
Mandela in South Africa. So much depends on this iconic figure who represents the stability, the integrity of a whole country. Georgia today is a far cry from the Shevardnadze periods when the country was veering towards disintegration. The most recent parliamentary and presidential elections demonstrated that a free, fair and peaceful transition of power can take place in a country renowned for its chaotic political history. In addition, the nation has fully embraced independence and is aspiring to become part of a wider Europe, a plan that is regarded as an insurance policy against painful territorial breakups and bloody conflicts. As the nation strives to achieve a higher standard of living, the patriarch serves as a reminder to his people that man does not live by bread alone. Europe still has a long way to go before reaching paradise, he cautions, and the Georgian people must not forget their origins. We are a traditional society and people's uh, embracing of the patriarch and the roots of our uh, faith, which was ruthlessly in blood drowned and forgive, for, forbidden for close to 100 years uh, are in the fact that people e almost intuitively feel like while we are on the path of progress uh, we cannot do so without maintaining um, our roots. The Georgian language offers a curious example of the influence of religious thought on the nation's culture. In Georgian, the word for guilt and compassion is one and the same lending credence to the Christian idea that a guilty person is deserving of sympathy rather than punishment. A simple and deeply humanistic concept, yet alien to the Western understanding of law and order, but essential to the credo that Patriarch Ilya II has lived by all his life and which he is determined for his people to preserve. Georgians balk at the notion that high materialist living standards and economic achievements in Europe and North America result from a superior culture. Every nation, whether big or small, should choose its own path, in great part defined by its history, culture and faith. Perhaps due to the fact that our history has been nothing but infusions of different cultures, I can tell you, it would be very shallow of us to think that this is the first time one system has replaced the other. Byzantine Empire uh, has been at war with polytheistic uh, Rome over Georgia and Ottomans have been at war with Tsarist Russia over Georgia and uh, Mongols have been at war with Arab Amiras and Khalifas over Georgia and uh, uh, Mazdeanic Persia uh, has been at war with uh, anti Christian Elada over Georgia. And so uh, all of these great uh, eras have left their imprint on how we think, how we are. And yet our nation has somehow managed to not break its spine maintain its identity and integrity and we are faced with another yet difficult era when communist and socialist system is out and the great very vocal very diverse western way of living is in and how we handle this another yet transition how do we digest how do we make sure that we absorb only uh, those features of the Western culture that, that strengthen us uh, and become part of us and don't, don't cause us problems with digestion and don't cause us problems with identity is, is obviously uh, up to us. But I think our past has prepared us well and, and our, in our present, our patriarch is one of the central figures in this process.